Awesome. Thank you, Candice. Appreciate that. Yes. Um, so coming off the heels of a recently um, released state of software security report, we're happy to take this next hour or so and share some of the more interesting sort of statistics and data that, that come out of it. And I'm actually excited to be excited to be joined um, by both Matt and Steve in order to get some of their insight um, and uh, industry expertise as far as like what what do some of these numbers we've seen a lot of the statistics and the survey results but what do we feel that the underlying backstory is and some of the reasoning behind it so we'll we'll start by this by actually um looking at addressing some of these cybersecurity challenges that we've seen that have come out of this open um source software security report in order to start that one of the things that um i think makes sense to actually give a little bit of background um, how did this uh, security report come about? What were some of the steps associated with it? Um, Steve being one of the co-authors as well as Sneak, um, the research behind it started back in, in March 2022. And actually this state of open software security report is something that's an annual uh, report that's been going on since uh, 2018 here at Sneak. Started the research in March um, as part of some of the background for that research. Leveraged, you know, um, across the industry, did a, a, a quite a few, you know, 15 different interviews with open source maintainers, cybersecurity experts, to make sure that we were asking, you know, some of the right questions in order to extract a lot of the data that we would see as useful. Um, launched the survey in April, um, and then that brought us to where we are today as part of that survey. We did target a few different audiences across different types of organizations, sizes, scopes, looked at open source um, software maintainers, contributors to that, occasional contributors, even some of the developers as well as consumers of um, the open source software within the software supply chain. As part of that, there were over 550 responses. Um, and then again, they, they went across many different sort of ecosystems and backgrounds. So without further ado, let's actually jump into some of the details of what we saw as part of this. Um, in this, um, what we have seen and some of the things that we were able to drive is that the open source security is, is still a, a significant challenge, right? And, and as part of what we're seeing as the software supply chain, it seems to be growing in complexity um, of not only controlling uh, and adopting to what you have, but also with the growth and adoption of applications, uh, we're seeing it become a much bigger sort of focus, as well as a little bit more difficult to, um, to tackle. One of the ways to actually make the session just a little bit more interactive, I think we'll 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 pop up a poll real quick and get um, everyone's insight as far as if you start looking at um, you know within your organizations, if you interact with those, understanding what what your confidence level is in understanding the risk associated with direct dependencies. Uh, these are the dependencies that your developers bring in directly, right? Listing them specifically out, saying we're building this application with these components. And then in conjunction with that, um, also asking what your confidence level as far as the security of what are called indirect dependencies. And so for those of you that may not as be familiar with some of the development the process and we look at open source, when developers bring in an open source package, um, inside of that package very often are, are nested or, or references to other open source projects. And so you get this package A that might be leveraging another open source package B, which then might be leveraging C and D. And you get this hierarchy associated with it. Those lower level ones are very often referred to as indirect dependencies or transitive dependencies. So understanding the security risk associated with it is, is, is what we're looking for as far as feedback in this poll. Excellent. So as everybody fills that out, I'm going to transition and we will start talking about some of the insight um, that was captured as part of the open source security um, uh, report. Um, and as, as part of understanding those direct dependencies and those open source, one of the things that we were able to gather from some of the survey results were that the average open source software project uh, um, on average has about 49 current vulnerabilities. And this also spans across 79 of those direct dependencies that I look. Now that varies across ecosystems and what you're seeing are some of the survey results on the far right. Um, and interesting enough too, um, 
the the vulnerabilities associated with you know when it says that 49 vulnerabilities across those 79 direct dependencies another stat that was actually surfaced inside of this report mentions that 40 percent of those those 49 actually happen to be inside of the direct indirect dependencies of those transitive ones that we talk so knowing that there is this wide spectrum of of dependencies, indirect dependencies. Matt and Steve, I'd love to get some of the insight as far as, do you see this, you know, as, as uh, organizations grow applications, as, you know, there's digital transformation is a big focus across the ecosystem. Do you see this as, as growing in use, um, staying about the same, you know, kind of what some of the insights as far as what you're seeing as, as important takeaways from some of these stats as far as the, the prominence of, of these components? So, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's kind of probably a, an important point to make here that that um, dependencies aren't bad, right, by by the definition, you know, this is what has enabled uh, modern software development, right? So we don't reinvent the wheel all the time. We have these gigantic um, uh, resource pool of, of free and open source software that we can build on top of. And that, that's really what's enabled open source software to uh to become ubiquitous right so i mean dependencies you know are not necessarily a bad thing and i mean you know i, I fielded a couple of questions around this particular set of stats of like should i be considering not developing any anything in javascript right which is you know is clearly uh, <laughs> you know uh, not not a uh, not a thing that um that uh that, that i think this report is saying so i think you have to take some of this stuff in the context of what these individual ecosystems you know what what they look like when you when you uh when you um, work within them and you know javascript tends towards a model of things that are very small much smaller scoped but a lot more of them you know there tends to be a lot of choice and and a lot of projects that do uh, a lot of packages that do one particular very small thing whereas you know python there tends to be for each function there will be one leading package and that package may have a, a much bigger scope so um i think that's kind of important to to understand um the indirect dependencies issue you know is really the the the, the critical piece here that you know uh, uh, um uh, organizations need to understand what that that by using uh, this model, yes, you can develop software very quickly, but you're also potentially pulling in code that you weren't aware of, you know, that whilst you may have been aware of those direct dependencies, the indirects and, you know, down uh, along the chain, you know, make as you, as you know, from, from what we do at Sneak every day, you know, these, these can be, uh, can be very deeply nested, you know, uh, uh, dependencies and, uh, four or five plus levels deep. And often that's, where some of these issues in uh, in the software supply chain can come from. I mean, one of the things that occurs to me with in looking at the slide is that uh, this is really a great advertisement for why software bill of materials are important. Um, and the, the reality is, is that, you know, we need knowledge about what's in a component. Uh, we need to understand uh, how usable it is, whether or not we're licensed to use it or not. Um, and we need to be able to trust it. So we need to be able to have ways where the actual component and the information about the component is non-falsifiable so we can trust it. So uh, when you get into dependencies of dependencies, the, the transitive or the indirect ones, um, things can get very complicated. It's very hard to potentially always, you know, have information at your fingertips that will tell you about the usability and the trust and, and the actual metadata uh, describing the components. So, so this is a, it's a great reason to take SBOMs very seriously um, because that is probably one of the best ways to be able to address uh, the complexity that's, you know, as, as Matt was saying, as part of uh, modern application development. Totally agreed, and and I'm I'm actually glad that you mentioned the 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 software bill of material because I think that's a core component that goes hand in hand with a lot of this understanding and being able to uh, know where these risks are and be able to and then take action upon this. Right? It's it's not only you know for um, sharing externally in a lot of circumstances where we're seeing some um, 
uh, governance being dictated, but also just for internal use and consumption, I think is a critical element in making sure that you understand the present of the risk. I think that actually is a good transition to start to talk about what we also what what was also um, captured as part of this um, uh, survey results, where that you know as 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 we've seen this focus, and there's some some great examples we'll talk about in a little bit about um, open source and open source risks and larger sort of consumptions. And as we just saw, the amount of projects that were being used and leveraged and where some of those vulnerabilities are. One of the things that also was starting, um, I think, was was fairly apparent inside of these security res, uh, results is that there's still a struggle, I think, within a lot of organizations to prioritize open security. Like, how do we make it a core component? And when we started to look at one of these themes and some of the, the details behind it, what we were able to capture and what, what, what came out of this was that, you know, looking at these real results, only 49% of organizations um, currently have a security policy that addresses open source software. And so looking at, you know, both the size of the companies, as well as, you know, who of those said, yes, we do, and, and no, we don't or don't know. It's intriguing to see, even as you go across, like, again, you kind of understand that for um, small organizations, right? Because there's there's not um, as big of a prominence of security teams and the ability to, to address all of those. But, you know, as you start to look at larger enterprises to also see that, you know, there's, um, close to 30%, almost 30% um, of those, some of those very, very large organizations and, you know, 20% that still don't have open source security policies in place. Um, it's interesting to see that some of these organizations are still, you know, struggling with that or going down that, that path. And so this is also another one where I think it's, it's great to get some insight um, as far as what, what you see, you know, Matt, Steve, um, as the impact of that right you know some of these organizations that are easily don't have one currently or still struggling to to actually get one in place and what what the impact inside of their organization might be and other things that they should be considered as far as not having that as part of a security policy yeah this uh this question and, and the responses to it was was one of the one of the bigger disappointments to me um uh, when i went through and analyzed the data um, on an overall level, um, the right-hand side of the screen is absolutely correct. We had only 49% of organizations had an OSS security policy. Um, we also had, let's see, 34% that didn't, and then we had 17% that didn't know. And if you uh, take out the don't know, not sure's at this point, um, which can be done uh, from the standpoint of doing analysis, it ends up being about a 60-40 split 60% have a policy, 40% don't have a policy. That 40% is a really large number. Um, as far as what the impact of this can be, um, I think it all comes down to governance, risk, and compliance. Um, if you don't have a policy, um, let, let me back up just to say, not having an open source software uh, security policy is a little bit different than not having a software security policy. And we have, uh, we didn't have a question, uh, the higher level question, which was, do you have a software security policy in place? And I'm going to do that next time around. Uh, this was specifically open source. I mean, in some ways, I would think that if you had uh, overall sec uh, software security policy in place, the incremental step to have an open source one wouldn't be too much of, a, of an effort. Um, but this is still, being debated quite a bit inside of um, Linux Foundation. So we, we can't presume anything at this point. Um, but the reality here is that even with 49% that don't have an open source security policy in place, how do you really, how do you address governance, risk and compliance issues? I mean, you can't effectively manage risk. Um, you don't really know enough about what you're gonna do when it comes to vulnerabilities. Um, so your security posture suffers mightily your, the quality of what you're producing can suffer. Um, and this shines a, a bright light on the fact that uh, Linux Foundation already has courses in training and certification on best practices for secure software development. Notice we didn't even say open source secure software development. And there's about 150 best practices and you don't have to you know, eat them all at once. Um, they're tiered in levels, silver, you know, silver um, gold and platinum, I think. Um, 
But the reality is, is that if you don't have a policy in place, you're probably addressing best practices for doing secure software development in a very ad hoc kind of random way. And policy is one of the best ways to not only uh, get organized from the standpoint of understanding what's important about security, but then making sure you're addressing it, but also taking the next steps beyond that with things like um, scalability and automation. So I got uh, co-opted the, uh, the, the, uh, the platform here. But Matt, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, I, I think there's a couple of interesting things to me from, from this stat. I mean, you know, clearly uh, that you go into a, a question like that thinking that, you know, small organizations are going to struggle more with kind of policy driven, um, with policy driven stuff or, around, you know, the, the more challenging aspects of security. So it, that's somewhat unsurprising that that split. I think the, uh, the, the fairly large um, uh, sort of uh, cohort of larger organizations there is the one that's, that's really quite surprising. Um, I think there's probably a couple of different things going going on there. I mean, you know, uh, most larger enterprises are, you know, have some challenges around, um, you know, making change can be difficult from a cultural perspective. You know, clearly dealing with with sort of open source software development is a uh, it, it is a different kind of uh, security approach to the sort of things that we've seen, you know, over the last 20 years. So you've kind of got that that inertia in larger organizations that can be a, a factor there. And, um, and, and I guess, you know, it, it, it probably says something about some of the perceived challenges are, are about putting in place a policy, you know, what should be in a policy about open source, right? And I mean, unless you've got a fairly good understanding of, of what are the things that you need to be thinking about around open source software, um, you know, then formulating a policy becomes more difficult. I mean, as Steve has pointed out, there are a lot of resources out there, um, templated policies on, on this kind of stuff available from, from the Linux Foundation and from others. But I think it definitely highlights that, that organizations find it a challenge and, you know, for, for, it's not just about the code when we when we talk about about risk around open source software either, right? Because we've got to think about um, governance models. You know, is that software well maintained? Is there a single maintainer who's going to go rogue? And you know, as we've seen in the some of these recent kind of ransomware things, and um, you know, how do we identify what what are the the uh, the sort of uh, positive elements that we should be looking for within a particular piece of software, and that's not just about function, you know. It's a wider thing. So I I think there are you know a, a lot of challenges that that organisations face when starting to think about this thing. But I mean, having a policy is kind of even if the policy is a one liner, right? It's got to be better than zero policy because you know at least it proves that you've that you've started to. Uh, to think about what the issues might be. Whereas if you don't have any kind of policy in place, you're effectively flying a plane blind. And, you know, one of the other things that I think uh, you see in uh, in the wider report is that there's a pretty strong correlation between having an open source policy and your confidence in the security around your open source software. You know, so whilst having a policy is not a proxy for for, for security maturity, you know, I mean, who's to say what, what's in a policy, you know, in a, in a survey, but, you know, there's certainly a strong correlation there in sentiment, right, Steve? Yeah, absolutely true. Yeah, I would agree. And I think that's one of the things in the, we're obviously not going through everything that's that's in the report, because there's quite a bit of information that's covered in there. But I do know, Steve, that there's a lot of cross-referencing as far as, you know, having security policies in place and looking at security postures and confidence in those security postures. And so it's it's interesting to see some of the correlations that can be derived when you actually start to cross-reference those. Yeah, I mean, just, to, just to, to explain that a little bit further, throughout the report, um, since I did most of the analysis behind the uh, survey data, one of the things that I did was to display uh, most questions segmented by, do you have an open source security policy or do you not have a, a, an open source security policy? And the, the differences typically are quite striking. Um, so that really makes the makes the strong case for having an open source security policy. Agreed. Awesome. And as, as we start to look at, um, it, ones with those open source security policies or even organizations that have started to take some sort of 
proactive ways of actually looking at the security posture with those open source um, packages. There were some interesting sort of information and data that was shared across the approaches that we're seeing across the organizations. Like what are they actually putting into place as far as the ability to look at that security risk, right? Some of the things that are being utilized today. Um, now I know some of these buckets potentially um, group together and package some of those details, but what we did see is that, you know, at least 44% of, of companies have some way to, you know, examine the source code to look for a lot of those risks and see, you know, a couple of different approaches in here um, across, you know, sort of the spectrum. With that said, obviously, again, knowing, you know, Steve, Matt, your backgrounds, the interactions you do with all of these organizations and heavily in involvement in the, in the developer community, love to get, again, some additional insight as far as what you're seeing and how they align with the information that, that we were able to derive or, Steve, that you were able to derive through the security report and kind of how that, you know, maps back to some of this data here. Well, I think, um, I mean, just starting from the left, there's two things I think that are important that I'm, that I'm going to discuss. Well, the first is on the left here, the 44% who use tools to examine source code. Um, I counted about 10 or so different tool categories uh, when it came to tools for helping address security. Um, and this would be across the life cycle of the application. Now, most of these tool categories had to do with CICD type activities. So very much focused on development, but not all of them. Um, but um, so I think the 44% doesn't mean uh, developers are out there using IDEs to kind of comb through their code, uh, maybe when a, the four eyes kind of uh, approach. Uh, to check to check it because that's just a, a, a very grossly inefficient way to, to, to do some sort of uh, evaluation of your code base. Um, but there are a tremendous number of very uh, good tools out there uh, to be able to that, that need to be uh, used. And I think we'll probably have a slide on this later, but the popular ones for of course are SAS tools for static analysis uh, for security testing and then SCA tools. Um, you know, for looking at uh, license uh, compliance and vulnerabilities. Uh, so those are those are two great categories, but I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that um, in the survey results, infrastructure as code IAC played incredibly well from the standpoint of uh, people using it to help deal with security. And you're probably wondering, well, you know, how does IAC do that? Well, it's primarily the fact that IAC is very good at automation. And if you're automating activities across CICD, um, that's removing manual touch points. And those manual touch points are where shortcuts can be taken and introduce all sorts of security risks. So that was, I think, the storyline behind IAC. And then the DAST tools uh, for dynamic uh, application security testing um, did not uh, play as well as I had hoped. Um, and I don't, I think organizations should lose sight of DAST mostly because uh, that's a very much a runtime focus. And that's an important uh, way to be able to make sure that you have better coverage across the life cycle. I think one of the things that was that was positive to me about these numbers are, you know, particularly um, some of these some of these categories uh, sl are slightly down from the top, you know, about checking that the uh, the project has an active community looking at the frequency of commits and releases, you know, that the, this is clearly, uh, you know, indicating that people uh, who are answering this particular question do have an understanding about those those things that are important to consider above and beyond the the actual code within open source projects. So I think that was a that was a uh, a, a good thing to have to 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 see in this in this particular graph. Yeah, when it comes to the adoption of components for use in code, I think many of the responses here are essentially saying, listen, we need to look at the community that, that, that is actually responsible for the component and have a, a sort of a have a good sense of how they function and whether and how they operate. Um, and I think many of the responses here are exactly that. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, what we're starting to see across the industry is uh, new ways of providing that information to uh, consumers of, of open source software. You know, I mean, 
we start out from things like GitHub stars, but I think now we're starting to get, you know, a, a lot better at, uh, you know, if we look at the, the open SSF scorecards project, you know, and, and uh, you know, Sneak Advisor is obviously a, a free service that we provide that, that give um, potential users much more detailed insights about not just the, the vulnerabilities that exist in that code, but about, you know these other factors you know does that does that uh project have good governance does it you know does it have the the right things that need to exist in that repository to to give you confidence that the maintainers are actively considering security as part of their software development process yeah i'm i'm, I'm glad both of you mentioned that because that was the one thing i think i derived from this was more of the approaches to identify trust, right? Yeah. Like building on a, like a, a full framework associated with, you know, how do we actually, we, we want to leverage this open source. It's a big prominent part of, of organizations and building, you know, any sort of modern application. And in order to do so, there's got to be this sort of measurement of trust in order to understand what that is and using sort of multiple pronged approaches in order to validate that. And Steve, you both mentioned this, right? Like looking at the community, understanding if it's active, looking at the reputation of the maintainers and some of the details, how active is it? When is what changed last? And understanding sort of a broader spectrum uh, associated with that, I think becomes a critical part of that, that security posture, at least from a proactive perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how this has changed over the last 20 years. You know, this is this idea of maintainer trust is is something that's, you know, it, it, it's been talked about for a very long time in, in open source communities. And, you know, as as communities have scaled, you know, there was a time when even in large projects that every main to every contributor knew every other contributor. Right. I can certainly remember even in even in the bigger projects where where that might be the, the been the case, you know, 15, 20 years ago. But clearly that's not the case in, in anymore and you know uh, i mean as we started off saying you know we tend to find these these vulnerabilities in smaller projects anyway where uh, you may not know who the maintainer of that particular uh, project is but yeah trust is 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 what it comes down to at the end of the day right yep Excellent. So now let's 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 transition over into I'm sure you know everybody's favorite topic, um, which which um, became a very prominent um, discussion track the end of last year, which was the the log for shell vulnerability, um, the one that originated in in open source. And so looking at some of the impact on understanding um, some of the relationships and a lot of the things reiterating I think a lot of the points that we talked about, which are also very prominent inside of the report. There's a couple of interesting statistics um, and data points that I think were able to be shared, which was when we looked at log for shell um, it was that, you know, and, and again, some of this based upon, you know, sneak um, um, being in this market, being able to see, you know, massive amounts of, of projects and understand, you know, the implications of, of customers that were impact that 70, 79% of projects were actually affected by log for shell And Matt, I think you, you even mentioned earlier, some of that ubiquity associated with open source and how they're becoming very common sort of components inside of, you know, a lot of major applications, this being a perfect example take that and also you know compound it hand in hand with the fact that when when we we looked at the open source you know the log for j component um 60 percent of the instances of those uh the those open source packages were actually in, indirect I meaning they were in transitive which could be you know several layers deep being used and consumed by other sort of core components and so i'm interested again to hear you know matt and steve your perspective on what did this mean like what 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 would what did you see as far as the impact you know and i know a lot of us were involved very closely with you know talking with organizations walking them through helping them um be able to address and remediate a lot of these in a very very fast time frame but you know knowing sort of all of these the this data about how prominent it was and then also the fact that it existed multiple times and sometimes you know buried several layers deep but what sort of that um what 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 organizations had to deal with at the time of this this you know making the headlines I mean, this is kind of the perfect storm, right? I mean, and this is this is the kind of story that that 
that you know uh, happens every couple of years and you know it brings this it brings this right to the forefront of people's minds you know log 4 j incredibly well used um piece of of uh, utility software to add logging functions to 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 java uh programs and you know therefore it was being used by you know a, a enormous spectrum of the the all of the java code that was you know that exists in the world um, and I mean, the, the, on the one hand, you know, that's brilliant that, that, that such a piece of software exists and it's fantastic utility and, you know, means that, that people don't have to reinvent the wheel. But when you when you do have uh, a vulnerability in in uh, something that is this widely used, then, you know, clearly the impact of it is uh, is 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 very uh, widespread. And um, I, I mean, the actual vulnerability had been in Log4j for several years, right? I mean, it was a very small programming mistake. Uh, and uh, it was only when when someone worked out how you could actually exploit it that it be, even became an issue, right? So, um, but but uh, yeah, I mean, this, this kind of illustrates, I, I guess, what we're talking about, this idea that, uh, you know, uh, open source projects can be a victim of their own success and 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 i think that uh when you have infrastructure software you know scaffolding software that's that's in a, a enormously wide uh range of things the impact of uh of of issues being found with that can be gigantic and i mean this is still going on right and we were talking before we came on air here about the amount of embedded, uh, the amount of, of Java programs in the embedded space, where it's incredibly hard to change it, right? It's it's flashed into the hardware, you know that that's uh, that's all still going on. So I, I think it definitely sharpened people's minds about the need for uh, software composition analysis scanners, right? I mean, you know, we certainly saw a, a, a very large uptick in uh, in um, in usage of of, of Sneak tied directly to um to organizations trying to solve this problem because you know people just didn't know whether they were impacted by it or not because you know they've got you know big enterprises java is an incredibly popular language you know i've got ten thousand business applications running inside my organization i mean that's panic time right yep i, I think it also go ahead steve sorry I was going to say, realistically, you know, SCA tools are the only way that you can crawl across an entire portfolio in an automated way to be able to understand what the, you know, what the impact is going to be uh, when a phone went built in like this is found. Yep. I think it also, like, it, and kind of beating the same drum that we have before, but it, it, it starts to reiterate um, the importance of some of those open source security policies, um, because without some sort of plan in place, when something like this does roll along, you know, the ability to actually react, right, to take action, to have sort of the components in place in order to have some sort of structured mechanism to say, okay, what do we, what do we do, <laughs> right, what, what, what's the next steps, we need to know where we have this, you know, where, what we need to do to actually go down the path of remediation and, you know, the steps to actually fixing all of those issues when they're, when they're discovered. Uh, and, you know, you've got, you've got absolutely no way of knowing you know if it's if it's down your tree of indirect dependencies i mean it's 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 okay if it's in your direct dependency you can do a version bump you know but how do i how do i deal with this thing that's like five levels deep and you know you've got all of these dependencies that all need a version bump in order to in order to uh to to get rid of that one so yeah yeah the chain reaction definitely was was caused by by that um that discovery yeah, I, and I don't think this is you know I know uh, this is probably a uh, a slightly controversial statement but I think sometimes you need things like that to happen in order to drive change right I mean I I think you know he, he, that's definitely like I said sharpen people's minds about you know that you should have something in place to to be thinking about this and and to be concerned about it and without that, you know, you may not have had as much change as, as I think it, it's driven in the last few months. Yeah, it's a, it's a valid point. The best way to 
know how to prepare for a storm is to live through a storm. So I, I, I don't necessarily agree, disagree with that. Um, so it, building on this, right, like as, as we start to discuss a lot of these statistics that were, were, were captured um, and some of the information, one of the other themes that we, we saw was the fact that finding um, a, a solution for this, right, a, a complex solution for a complex problem um, was one of the other, I think, key takeaways that, that was shared inside of this report. And one of the other more interesting ones, and I know, again, you know, as, as, as we were discussing this earlier, is this is one of the interesting statistics that, that came out of the, um, the, the survey results and that the fact that the time to fix vulnerabilities um, since, you know, since we go back a few years and when we started originally publishing these reports, you know, it has gone from 49 days um, to, to, to now 110 days. So a fairly substantially increase, you know, over, over, you know, a span of three years. And then um, one of the other things that was also kind of intriguing is, is looking at the fact that fixing vulnerabilities um, takes, a, you know, almost 20% longer than fixing organization's own first party proprietary code. Um, I know some of this and I, I, I want to turn it over to you and Steve and Matt because I, I know you definitely have some insight as far as the, the stories behind it, but there was there was also an interesting statistic that was shared um, uh, last week at the uh, Open Source Security Foundation um, conference in which, um, you know, with this, this expansion and growth of, of open source packages, currently um, upwards about 30 30% of a lot of those packages only have a single maintainer, and in some cases, none. Um, so I'm curious as far as what your insight into why we're seeing sort of this increase in the amount of time that it actually takes to get some of these vulnerabilities fixed once they are, you know, discovered. Well, I guess one of the things to, uh, to note here is that 49 days was back in 2018 and uh, we're up to 110 now. So, so uh, over a span of three years, we've just more than doubled uh, the amount of time it takes to fix. Over that same period of time, uh, two things have happened. One, uh, software use and development has been growing at, at tremendous rates. And at the same time, um, when it comes to open source software and security, security has become a far more important topic now than it was back in 2018. Uh, it's not, not even any, any, anywhere close to, uh, back in 2018, it was, it was, it was a shadow of what it is today. So I think both of those things are um, fa significant factors here. We're paying much more attention to security uh, as a consequence, there's more time that's being spent on security. We're much more attuned to uh, the, the concerns about vulnerabilities. Um, but one thing that's not, so there's lots more potentially that has to be fixed these days because there's so much more software. So I think, um, and we have resourcing issues when it comes to actually software development. So I think all of these things kind of combined together is helping push the, the time window out the one thing that is good news is that if you look at the criticality of these different kinds of fixes that are being put in place, the really critical fixes are happening very quickly, but with an increased number of fixes that are required to be addressed, some of those low, low priority ones just aren't being addressed in a Tommy fashion because of the resourcing issues. So I think that's part of the explanation behind what's going on. Here. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I I would have said basically the, the same thing that I, ironically, you know, this does it actually exposes somewhat that we're we're actually getting better at detecting vulnerabilities. Um, but uh, but clearly, we you know we've got a, a, a resourcing issue there in terms of uh, of, of managing to solve uh, some of the lower um, priority things. And you know, I mean. Uh, open source is a is a broad church, right? And for every huge, well-funded project like the Linux kernel, like Kubernetes, you know, there's there's ten thousand projects that are being run by you know one person in their spare time, and you know, prioritizing uh, security fixes, particularly with things that 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 may be perceived as as uh, less less important, um, you know, versus versus use of feature velocity and 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 support and all the rest of the things that that open source maintainers have to have to do, you know, is uh, is a challenge. I mean, I, I suspect if we took some of the uh, if we looked at this across some of the, the the biggest projects, we would actually find that the time scale is very short to fix um, 
to fix vulnerabilities. But when we look at these things in in aggregate across you know across a huge range of uh, 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 of projects of different sizes and all the rest of it, then you know we're clearly going to going to see that uh, that resource issue that's at the uh, that's at the the base of of some of these issues. Um, I, I, in terms of the, uh, the the fixing vulnerabilities in open source, in the open source portion of applications versus the the kind of homegrown portion of applications, um, when we look at, at, at uh, typically in most modern applications, that portion of open source is actually far larger. So you know, in 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 some ways, that that's always going to skew that skew that number. Um, Somewhat, uh, because you know, eighty twenty of of uh, is it, it ends up being a typical split of of people you know in in language ecosystems using packages. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, and that's a very good point. Is that there's probably more open source than a lot of modern applications, and the fact that there's probably less resources there as well. And I know that's a, a big focus of the um, Open Source Security Foundation is to, to promote more community awareness and sharing, collaborating, and giving back. And I think those go hand in hand with, with um, potentially addressing and fixing some of these, these issues as we see sort of more and more use, right, the ability to actually handle those appropriately. But I think an insight of what you both just shared, how the critical ones being handled, and again, there's disparity and differences between between you know potentially some of the larger ones and the ones that are used a lot more often. This was a, a, an interesting finding, um, and and I know like as far as um, as we start to talk about you know the the open source um, first party code and some of the other components in a lot of these applications, looking at some of the survey sort of results as far as you know what organizations were using, what what approaches that they were taking, and. Um, one of the interesting ones to, to see, and I think this is probably just more consistent than what we've seen over the, the last few years, is the fact that you know SaaS static application security testing software composition analysis tools are still ranked number one and number two in the ability to address a lot of these um, security concerns. Um, but I, there also seems to be a, a wide variety of different approaches for um, you know how organizations are also starting to tackle these is either augmenting those or very complementary approaches or just sort of um, additional techniques of looking for those vulnerabilities. So curious as far as like, again, with, with the uh, industry interaction and, and organizations that you talk to, if, if this is in line with what you're seeing and, and other thoughts that you might have on approaches to actually, you know, help address and um, what we'll talk about a little bit is actually automating some of these approaches as far as helping organizations address these risks. One of the things that kind of comes to my mind here was that um, is the whole uh, theory behind doing SCA, which is that uh, doing it on a time-based kind of principle is probably not the best approach. And so one of the, the challenges I think that exists here, and I'm interested to see if, if uh, Mick or Matt, you have um, insight into that, is how to how to deal with SCA in more, on, in more of a, a real-time or near real-time kind of basis. Um, because there needs to be, uh, when vulnerabilities become known, there needs to be sort of immediate potential to take action on them um, and a time-based approach to being that has a lot of latency built into it is probably not your friend when it comes to trying to get some of these vulnerabilities to go. Yeah, I mean I, I think you know when we talk about this whole landscape, you know, there, there are there are uh, two, it's it's not just one challenge, right? We've got this challenge of of the open source supply chain having become a, a uh, fertile place for attackers to look for 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 exploits, but we've also got in in general, um, you know, this that organizations need to move towards this, you know, what we call the developer first security model, right? Where you've got to change the way you do security from being like this kind of gatekeeper function at the end through to something that's integrated all the way through your software development life cycle. And that's because, you know, velocity is absolute key to success in, in the modern era. And, you know, we can't treat security in the same way that we used to. So I think, um, you know, seeing, uh, so seeing organizations who've managed to build into those multiple integration points all the way through their software development life cycle is, is you know, a real key success metric for people who are starting to get how we really need to do this stuff. And, you know, to Steve's 
point. You know, once we've got those, you know, uh, regular tests on source code management systems, we're testing on every PR, we're testing in production. You know, all these, all these, uh, these integration points in the SDLC have subtly different reasons to do them, right? And you kind of need to be thinking about doing all of them because you know, they, they're detecting different things. So, you know, uh, giving developers access to tooling where they can immediately see before that code's even been checked in that there are issues with a particular dependency or issues with lines of code that they've just written, you know, is, is absolutely critical. The cheapest place to fix anything is before it's even been checked in, right? But then, you know, having those integration points into your source code management, into your CI CD pipeline, you know, it, you need to be doing those things as well so that you can, you know, you have real time updates on, uh, you know, none of this is fixed. We're constantly on this on this sliding floor of new vulnerabilities being being uh, being found and, and new exploits every day. So uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, being able to integrate that stuff is is where you start to get the most bang for your buck from a security perspective. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to something I said earlier, which is there's probably about 10 fairly popular tool categories when it comes to being able to address uh, security across the life cycle. And for instance, you know, I mentioned IAC tools and the, the value they have from the standpoint of automation. Well, there are IAC scanning tools to help you ensure that the IAC uh, scripts that you're running don't end up creating uh, additional headaches. And there's scanning tools also and policy tools for um, cloud service providers, uh, being able to check on the resources that you're getting from them and whether or not from a security standpoint, they're, uh, they're where they need to be. So uh, I think one of the things to take away from this beyond what we just see here on the screen is this, is this notion of take a look in the report uh, to get a sense of what those additional different tool categories are and, and you know, begin to think about how they may be able, able to also, you know, some of them add a significant value to what you're already doing. And, and I think the uh, the automation piece of this is really key as well. I mean, we did some work uh, last year as part of our cloud native security report where we, um, looked at uh, how automated um, uh, organizations' deployment pipelines were as a kind of proxy for how far along you were on your, your kind of journey towards cloud native, because, you know, that's a very strong indicator. If you are doing end-to-end, -end, you know, fully automated deployments, there are, there are uh, um, you know, a whole set of things that have to be in line there to to get there so it's a fairly good proxy for that and uh we saw very strong correlation between uh folks with high levels of uh, of deployment uh pipeline automation how easy it was for them to implement uh security scanning tools because you know you're fully automated ci cd you've got lots of hook points that are you know it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense that it becomes much easier to to integrate automation in there and then a, a, a very strong correlation between um uh that and time to fix so a, a dramatic drop in how long it was taking people to find and fix vulnerabilities when they had that automation in place all the way through the sdlc yeah, the, the automation, I think, is key, which I think is a good transition to where, to where we're going with this, but the automation and being able to take more of a proactive approach in a lot of these types of circumstances, not disregarding, um, Steve, what you just mentioned, which is still the ability to have the reactive component, because those are still very critical when you start looking at open source and the dynamic nature of which, you know, the the, the vulnerabilities and risks change, as, as, as Matt mentioned earlier, right, like the, the vulnerability in Log4j had been in there for, for quite a few years. Um, it just happened that it was discovered um, at a very specific time, and then we remediated and everybody had to take action in order to follow up to ensure that they, you know, were, were in line with, with a lot of those changes based upon that, that timing. Proactive, giving you more of the efficiencies, but having always a plan in place in order to ensure that you're, you know, um, being able to react when the situation does change. With that said, I think, and these were some of the core sort of components, I think that, that you could easily start to derive out of that, that report. And there is, again, a lot more extensive information as Steve just alluded to that, you know, there's, there's a lot of data points that are in there that are very interesting, which have probably stories behind them and some of the intriguing elements that I think is, is useful to you as we'll share the link for the, the full report here in just a little bit. From a takeaways perspective, I think one of the one of the more 
more prominent themes that we've seen. Um, and again, these go hand in hand, both from a from a from a sneak perspective and as well as an um, uh, Linux Foundation perspective is, you know, it, encouraging developers to improve their security knowledge is the, the more that you can take information and especially with with you know the the larger adoption and creation of applications the explosion of applications uh, the more drive for rapid development um, the more you can take that security expertise and bundle it into some sort of format within a workflow of the developers starts to 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 empower them Right, it allows to have some of those secure coding best practices, approaches, visibilities into risks early in that decision making process become one probably one of the more key sort of approaches for being able to address a lot of these security issues as early as possible. Hand in hand with that, I think is you know as we were just you know discussing, there's a lot of sort of approaches and solutions that you can start to leverage in order to take that capability and actually leverage it um, within the pipeline, within the PR checks, within the IDE. And so leveraging solutions, one of the other themes that we haven't spent as much time um, that I know is, is embedded inside the report as well was this um, um, data points that um, a lot of the um, um, individuals that were involved with the survey also asked for more um, vendor expertise to embed more sort of security insight into controls to take more ownership of that so that, you know, there wasn't all of these you know, pockets of individual knowledge and that the industry starts to take a lot of this more responsibility on in order to help promote that with, mm. with those organizations. Steve, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's absolutely correct. That, that was one of the key takeaways which was the uh, users were looking for more intelligent tooling from the vendor community. Um, and it's not that the, use, that the users are trying to abdicate responsibility and say, well, this security issue is best solved by somebody else because there's lots that the user community should be doing themselves. But I mean, it's, it's still a point well taken, which is uh, more intelligent tooling and integration between the different kinds of tools. Uh, would go a long way to be able, able to have a better approach to how we do to deal with security and probably not at the expense of, of more time on the part of the developers if the tools were more intelligent and had better integration. Yeah, and that, that was an interesting one to see. And then, then the last sort of key takeaway I think that we've seen with all of this goes hand in hand with kind of the, the, the first two approaches. The more that you can empower and share and then start to embed into a very proactive way but doing so in an automated fashion right automate 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 is build into those checks and matt matt discussed earlier is looking at one of the ways that we looked at that cloud native application security um, report last year was to look at organizations that had reached that maturity as, as sort of that that mechanism or bar to say is you know, are they more mature because they have some of these approaches that allows them to do way more with less. So the more I think that you can embed a lot of that capability in there, it allows you to have that 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 speed of innovation, right? This this is probably one of the more core components because that's from a business perspective, that's what you're trying to achieve. Um, and so being able to achieve that speed of innovation and the ability to create these applications in a rapid fashion but still ensure that the risk of the security of the or the, the security of the organization is still being kept in check, um, I think is a critical component that we're seeing as far as a, a common theme here. Excellent. So with that said, um, as we mentioned early on, this is um, there is a link um, to the um, full report that you can download. There's a lot, like I said, a lot of additional insight that you can derive from that. There's some summarization that we share, you know, early on in the report, but then there's a lot of the details and and again, some of the the, the cross referencing that that Steve uh, shared earlier as far as you know what are some of the differences of ones with policies once without, how did that impact some of the other sort of server results and how did they map out? So a lot of really great insight that's in there. Um, and, you know, at Sneak and I'm sure the Linux Foundation as well, love the ability to entertain any, any questions. As a matter of fact, um, I don't know if we want to check the Q&A and see if there's any questions that are queued up. Um, and if so, we can address those. Otherwise, we can uh, turn it back over to Candace. Let's see if there's 
one in there. I see one question. Centralized API registry, IBM Z16 may increase the software cybersecurity. May I have your view on this? Um, Matt or Steve, I don't have the expertise on uh, API I'm registry. I'm not sure what that's referring to either. Okay. Okay. All right. I would have to go and, and do, some, uh, do some research. I'm assuming this is something in, in IBM's portfolio. So, uh, yeah. I mean, it is true that the Z series has a lot of unique capabilities that uh, go well beyond what other platforms have been able to accomplish. So um, I don't know specifically about security, but I think uh, I'm not surprised uh, given the nature of the question that this suggests that IBM is doing something relatively unique here that probably has uh, for the mainframe customers some significant added value. Excellent. So if there's no further questions, Candace, I will turn it back over to you to, to wrap up. Thank you so much, Mick and Steve and Matt today. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.